Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about the war on drugs is Dr. Dan Morheim. Dr. Morheim brings a unique perspective, physician, state legislator, academic, author, and consultant. As, a, as an emergency medicine physician, he's been on the front lines of healthcare for over 40 years. He is the author of two books, the most recent one in 2020 called Preparing for a Better End. How are you doing today, Dr. Morheim? Uh, good. Good to be with everybody. Hope you had a safe 4th of July weekend and uh, ready to go. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Um, the War on Drugs. Thank you. Let me go to my screen. And there we are. So here's the uh, disclaimer. Uh, this topic is really the war on drugs is an epic policy failure. Now, you may not think this affects you, but actually it affects all of us in ways that we may or may not expect. Um, it's about responsible for about 85 to 90 percent of crime. It's a major cause of overdose uh, deaths, overdose deaths in general, and overdose deaths has kind of been swept off the headlines by COVID, understandably, but it hasn't gone away. In fact, the data is that uh, overdose deaths in the United States are worse, and it's in every community uh, throughout the nation, rural, urban, and suburban. My interest in this, fortunately, does not come from personal experience, a personal private experience. I'm not uh, subject to this issue, and none of my family is, but it affects millions of Americans. My experience in this is to totally from being an emergency medicine physician for the last uh, 40 years. And even though, and let's be clear, no one is for substance abuse, well, what we have here is a policy failure. After 50, 60 years of all kinds of efforts, some well-intended, some not, as you'll see, uh, we're no better off. In fact, we're worse off. There's not one data point in relation to the war on drugs that is improved. And the impact on communities, on education, on business, on taxpayers is uh, profound. So what I want to emphasize to you is these are not just random events or fa moral failings or people without uh, control, all those elements are there, but a lot of this is the result of conscious policy decisions and they're not written in stone. And at the end, I hope you will uh, be convinced and begin to think about how you can change those policies. But let's acknowledge at the beginning, uh, and the way I do this, as I want you to read the slides. Uh, I'll read a couple of them, but basically you can read while I talk over. So we all want to change our moods and minds, and there's many ways to do that. They're healthy ways, uh, ranging from exercise, prayer, uh, relaxation, playing with family, going for a walk, all those kinds of things. Uh, but there are uh, less, da less dangerous ways. There are also more dangerous ways. And people have been using substances for thousands of years to alter moods. Usually in cultures, there are parameters on that. For, Amer for example, Native Americans had tobacco, but they weren't smoking tobacco the way uh, that happens in the United States. Uh, less now, but has happened dramatically. Here's Egyptian hieroglyphics showing cannabis from thousands and thousands of years ago. And uh, wine, of course, has been a sacrament uh, for a long time without necessarily alcoholism being the case. But let's jump forward now to this uh, modern times, 1970. I think many of you will recognize, of course, President Nixon on the right. To his right, our left, was John Ehrlichman. John Ehrlichman was his chief domestic policy advisor. And this is where the modern so-called war on drugs got started. Now, Ehrlichman went to jail for Watergate, but in, uh, later he uh, acknowledged his uh, crimes and he explained exactly what the war on drugs was about. And he said very clearly in a later interview, and I'll ask you to read the bold part, and this is one sentence I will read with you. By getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, his, their political enemies, Nixon's political enemies, criminalizing them, they could disrupt their communities. They could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, vilify them night and night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So no one is for substance abuse, but this was a political decision and it worked. And it continued in the Reagan war on drugs. And you can see here how the spending priorities, how we spend our money tells us our priorities. Uh, law enforcement got huge increases in spending and uh, drug prevention and education got huge reductions. This wasn't confined to just Republicans. Uh, the Clinton years had similar uh, actions. Uh, Clinton wanted to be tougher on crime than Republicans. That helped him win. And notice this one strike and you're out. What that meant is even when people who had drug convictions and went to jail 
and came out of jail, if they went to live with their family who was in public housing, the entire family would be kicked out of public housing. That's a really extreme policy. And so what happens over time is um, this has huge impacts on communities and it makes it very hard for anybody ever convicted of any drug uh, crime uh, to ever get back into legitimate society. And you can see the Drug Abuse Act, five year minimum sentence for simple possession of cocaine, even if no prior convictions. If you make that mistake, I'm not for cocaine use, but if you make that mistake, a five year sentence and a, and a conviction that follows you for life is not appropriate. Let's turn to another drug war expert, El Chapo, Joaquin Guzman. He says, uh, if there was no consumption, there'd be no sales. And so for him, growing up poor in Sinaloa, he uh, found this was the best way to make money. And unfortunately for too many people, it's a good way to make money or a bad way to make a lot of money. And the consumption is interesting. I mean, we consume. Uh, if, they weren't, if we weren't consuming drugs, there wouldn't be any sales. But notice also how he gets drugs into this country. It's real, I want you to start thinking of this as a global economic enterprise of enormous scale. It's not carried in by immigrants, uh, you know, with a few drugs on them. There may be some of that, but that's not big enough scale. The bigger scale here is submarines, airplanes, trucks, and boats. And even the Justice Department acknowledged that. Huge enterprise uh, going on here. And so, um, but it, it gets worse. Our overseas enemies go find uh, the drugs, uh, drug area, drug growing areas, and then they ship them in. So we've had this policy that has continued for many years that not only is destroying us from the inside, but shipping huge sums of money to those who would destroy us from the outside. That makes no sense to continue the things that we've been doing. Now let's look at the money for a moment. I've taken care of lots of patients in the ER and a lot of my information here comes directly from them. They didn't know I was in politics. I was a state legislator for 24 years. I'd be taking care of them some, for some condition or another. And it was pretty evident directly or indirectly that they had a drug problem. And I would ask them three questions. One, how much uh, uh, does drugs cost you each day? And they would say 10 to $200 a day. And for the hardcore daily users, that's 365 days a year. And uh, would you go into treatment if it was available? Yes, I would. And I'd say, where do you get the money? Now, some of them had legitimate jobs, but those usually faded. So over time was petty crime, trying to get other people addicted, actually, because if you're a substance abuser, you can get four or five people buying from you. You make the marginal difference that enables you to pay for your own habit. So they were making money that way and petty crime, some of which didn't get reported. Grandma's clock radio disappears. Somebody's wallet or purse is $20 lighter in a family. Those don't get reported to the police. But then they often, unfortunately, move their way further up the crime ladder as they get more and more desperate. Uh, prostitution, major drug dealing, other crimes start to take place. And let's do this calculation. I'm going to use Metro Baltimore because that's where I, I live in the greater metro area. This is not just a city. Uh, but uh, just do the math. Uh, 30,000 hardcore users times average of $50 a day times 365 days a year is almost $550 million. That's just money spent to buy the drugs. That doesn't count all the other terrible societal costs. And what happens when these lines of distribution of this international industry are disrupted by a hurricane or other problem? Um, people start raiding pharmacies. They start getting desperate. So it costs us a tremendous amount of money. Figure this out for your own metro area. You can do this arithmetic yourself and see what the cost is. Probably in the mid-Atlantic region, we're exporting over a billion dollars because these drugs are coming from the Far East, uh, so South America, and as, you'll, and as you may know, fentanyl from China. And here's the fentanyl from China part. Now I wanna tell you, a story of uh, one guy that I was taking care of. He, he was about in his late 50s. He'd been in jail for over 20 years. He was arrested when he was younger. And uh, I was a little terrified when I went in the room to see him. But as we got to talking, I could see he was a really smart and capable guy. And I asked him what he was in for. And he said drug dealing. And it turned out that he was actually a pretty major drug dealer. And he told me how it operated. He had vast amounts of drugs shipped in in large plastic bags, maybe from El Chapo or from China, who knows. 
And then they were broken down by people wearing no clothes so that they couldn't take the drugs out with them into little plastic bags. These were distributed by windowless vans all over uh, the uh, middle Atlantic region from uh, Washington, D.C. up to uh, southern New Jersey. And then all those dollar grimy five and 10 and 20 and $50 transactions were processed back in another room with people with no clothes on. And uh, that was his business operation. He personally didn't use drugs. And he got started, you know, he made had some minor crime when he was uh, 16, 17, but then it was on his record. He couldn't get a legitimate job. He couldn't get housing. He couldn't get education. And it was a waste of his life. And then I asked him, how much money were you taking home? I mean, it's just you and me in the room here. What were you making? And he said, uh, $25,000 a week tax-free. $25,000 a week tax-free. And that was in 1990 dollars because he had spent 25 years in prison and I was seeing him as a for routine physical exam so that he could go into a uh, halfway house. That's a lot of money. Multiply that throughout the United States, every rural and urban and suburban community, and you get a scale of what's involved here. We see a lot of these drug busts. There's the guns, there's the drugs being shipped, there's the money. And, uh, you know, as soon as one person goes down, another takes up because we consume. We consume. And if we could stop consuming, a lot of this would go away. Even if you could get a drug addict into treatment, a person with substance use treatment uh, today, what is today? Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it is, Tuesday. Tuesday. Tonight, they're not going to have to commit $50 worth of crime. Now, it doesn't mean there'll be a sober tax paying citizen you know, from now on. But think of it, and I, as I do as a doctor, as a relapse of a medical condition. Money laundering. Well, how does all this money flow? Now, here's from Forbes magazine. Forbes is hardly some radical. Uh, magazine. It's a well-respected business magazine, and they point out that from drug trafficking, all these major banks uh, are involved. So there's a huge amount of money flowing through. In fact, uh, some of the drug dealers have told me uh, in, in the medical situation, I'm not jail, so they just tell me stuff, that they have special uh, metal boxes that are designed exactly to stuff cash in, stacked very nicely, and feed it in through teller windows that are just slightly larger so it slides through nicely. And that's how they start laundering their money. And then they invest it in other things. Some of these banks have been fined a lot of money for them, for us, but not for them. They get fined 50, $100 million. That's a rounding error. That's the cost of doing business to these banks. So this is a big business. Now, here's a CDC report showing that this comes to a trillion dollars um, uh, uh, opioid use and the economic costs over 1.2 trillion. Now, that's data from 2017 and 2018, the report was just issued. So this is about three or four years old. And for a whole host of reasons that you can imagine, it's not better, it's worse. We've put a lot of people in prison. We take them and we put them in prison. And most of them are, are drug offenses. And many of those are life without parole. And most of the ones with life parole are people of color. This is the Nixon policy again the Reagan policy, the Clinton policy. It didn't say people of color, although Ehrlichman admitted to it, but this has hit minority communities much, much harder. And so, excellent book. I'll give you the resource, Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, and this one is worth reading. A drug war was waged almost exclusively against poor people of color. People already trapped in ghettos like jobs and decent schools. They're rounded up by the minions, packed away in prisons, and when released, stigmatized for life, denied the right to vote, and ushered, issued, ushered into a world of discrimination. And they were barred from employment, housing, welfare benefits, and saddled with thousands of dollars of debts. I've talked to a lot of substance abusers who'd like to get back into legitimate life. Now, some are just very difficult people. They may, may need to be in prison more than not, but most want to get better. They simply, those doors to legitimate behaviors are closed. The only doors that open are illegitimate and illegal behavior, and that's where they go. And then we end up paying for it. So there are a lot of related issues to this. Uh, we've cut a lot of social programs on the uh, racial disparity, cocaine powder versus crack cocaine. Crack cocaine, uh, a small amount would get you a lot of jail time. Cocaine powder wouldn't, even though they were the same, essentially the same drugs. Um, we have made some progress on cannabis legalization, maybe in your state. Now only 11 states do not allow medical or personal use, but uh, presumably, we are going to move on that. The prison industrial complex, private practice, private industry owns prisons. It's not run by states, and they have a vested interest in keeping this going. 
uh, electronic monitoring industry, those ankle bracelets. People who have come out of jail have to pay for electronic monitoring. They get deeper in debt and so, and they can't get employment. So the problem just compounds for them. The police have become militarized. To some extent that's necessary because they're facing really tough criminals out there. On the other hand, uh, having tanks and SWAT teams uh, uh, getting carried away on this just doesn't make any sense. And, and the police have become financially dependent on seizing uh, uh, private property of uh, drug dealers or even just people who live, happen to be living with people who have a drug problem. They will come in and take the car. There's one case of a woman who uh, legitimate working, her son had a drug problem. They picked him up and they seized her car as well, even though she was trying to drive him to treatment and to work. So it can get carried away, especially in some of the smaller police departments. This is how they maintain their financial uh, structures. But in the end, after all these statistics, it's about individual people. And uh, a lot of people have died. And you see these drug vigils all too common throughout our communities. Uh, I also link this, and you may know who Michael Smirkonish is, national columnist. Uh, I link this to uh, the, the surge at the border to the opioid crisis. And you can see here the CDC reported that deaths were, and all this use was up. People that are fleeing, I mean, people don't flee where they were born and raised unless problems are really bad. Think of pilgrims fleeing re religious persecution, people climbing the Berlin Wall, slaves running away, well, all sorts of situations. To walk from Guatemala to Mexico, up, all through Mexico with your children through heat and dangers to try on a thin, slim chance you might get into the US, you have to be really desperate. And it's the drug wars that we, by our consumption, have continue to support in uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico that is forcing a lot of these people to leave. And if we could do that and then invest in uh, legitimate economies in those countries, uh, we'd all be better off. So we all are paying for this. Whether we think we're immediately connected or not, we are paying for it. And I'll tell you, in healthcare costs, every time you may see a uh, an event like a gunshot wound or something, you know, I've worked in a trauma center for 25 years. Not only would I take care of the patient in my head, I'm thinking this is a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of uncompensated health care, and we're all paying for it. Even if it's not us, not our family, we're running a legitimate business. Some players we're taxpayers, we're paying for it in Medicaid. We're paying for this. And it's a lot of money. Just the drug wars alone, just the drug costs alone is a lot of money. Add on all these layers, it's a lot. So that's phase one. Those are public policies decisions, political decisions. They can be changed. Phase two came in the late 1998, 1999 with an emphasis on pain. And uh, as a clinician, we started getting all the clinicians, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, physicians, assistants, paramedics, we got to get into pain issues. And uh, there are serious issues about treating pain, but it got much more serious when Big Pharma, a couple of big companies got involved. Now, I'm going to show you some source material. You may never have seen this stuff before. In Maryland, and this happened throughout the United States, I was a member of something called the National Conference of State Legislators, and I chaired something called the Innovation and Healthcare Task Force. So I got to know legislators throughout the country. Big Pharma paid for people, and you'll see in a minute, going to states introducing bills like this. Now, I was a doctor before 1996. We treated people with pain. We didn't ignore pain. We weren't cold-hearted. Nurses were gracious and careful and wanted to make sure people weren't suffering. But suddenly, all these pain bills started appearing all over the United States. And it wasn't an accident. Here's a witness list from a Maryland legislative hearing. I was in the Maryland legislature for 24 years. And look at this first one. I remember this guy who came and testified. Smart, good-looking, affable. American Pain Foundation, then there was the Maryland Pain Initiative. Turns out later we find out that the American Pain Foundation uh, was a front paid for by Purdue Pharmaceuticals and a couple other big pharmaceutical companies. So they sent these lobbyists out to every state and tried to convince legislators to pass these pain bills. And, it, and I fought all these bills. Now it was tough for me in the legislature. I was the only physician in the legislature at the time and I'm fighting these bills and I'm trying not to be a hard hearted doctor, but it was run count, ran counter to the reality I knew from every shift I did in the emergency room. It got worse. The Maryland Board of Physicians, my licensing entity, and this happened in other states too. I just happened to have this copy because I'm in Maryland. They sent out a newsletter. This is the entity that controls whether I work or not, so you got to pay attention. 
And look at what they did. They created a hotline. That hotline went to a Purdue pharmaceutical rep who told us that uh, OxyContin was safe. Nonsense. And then they write this thing. Patient, there's inadequate crane control because physician reluctance to use medications such as morphine. Well, if they're trying to overcome reluctance to use morphine, the mirror image of that is use more morphine. So we were pressured tremendously to um, uh, give more narcotics. And as I was pointing out back here, there's just a few basic medicines that you can do and you quickly get to the narcotic uh, family when you've run through most of these. And medical cannabis not always available and those other medications aren't that uh, useful either for acute pain problems. So it wasn't enough that they just did it in March and they sent the speaker out and we, he spoke at uh, hospital conferences and uh, we were all sort of ordered to go hear him. And he said, uh, uh, the, oxy, the pain soaks up the OxyContin. I'll never forget when he said that, the pain soaks up the OxyContin. In my head, I'm thinking, what a lie, what nonsense. Wasn't enough they did it in well, spring of 1998. It went ahead in the fall of 1998 as well with another round of this stuff. And you can see right there, where's the grant from? Purdue Pharmaceutical Company. As you know, later find hundreds of millions of dollars, although the principals of the company did not suffer any jail time. They're certainly responsible for the deaths and the illnesses and the suffering of millions and millions of people. And we would get beat up. If uh, somebody had pain, that's when nurses started asking, do you have uh, pain? And uh, if they didn't, if they said yes, then we had to rush and go treatment. Unnecessary. We took care of pain fine. We didn't need all this intervention, but it happened. And we're still suffering the consequences of that today. And a lot of these people got addicted at that point when, when prescription drugs started to dry up because we got so the pendulum has now swung the other direction. Don't write any narcotics, which means that people who have legitimate pain sometimes aren't getting treated. Then those folks were addicted. They were going out to the street and, and consuming more illegal drugs with all the consequences of um, crime, disease, uh, and, and all the other issues. So we need to change new policy. New policy is time. And here's some of the ideas. And I want to focus on uh, a few of these. And, and really the big one is take the profit out of drugs. We need to get people into treatment 24-7, 365. Uh, so as an ER doctor, if you came in with a broken bone, uh, I might be able to treat it. If I couldn't, something really serious like a broken hip, I can get an orthopedist in there. I can take care of a lot of heart and lung conditions, but boy, if I need a cardiologist, we can get one in there two in the morning. But if you came in with substance abuse, in most emergency rooms, although it's a little better now, all I can do is give you a sheet of paper with a bunch of phone numbers and hope you call uh, and get treatment. That usually doesn't work. And the immediate return on investment, again, if we got somebody into treatment today, tomorrow, they're being less harmful to themselves and the people around them. They don't have to go out and make that $50, 365 days a year. Even if they're in treatment for just a year or 18 months, even if they relapse, they're going to eventually get better. And so this is a harm reduction strategy. We're not going to turn and solve this problem overnight. We got to stop turning people into criminals. It's changed the law. It's a health problem. Now, there's certainly a role for law enforcement, for major dealers, for people who commit violent crimes. Absolutely. I have voted some tough on crime issues. I have no problem doing that. But people who are making, uh, you know, just have a small amount of drugs, just get them into treatment. And I put in, in the United States, the first state legislator put in decriminalization, the possession of just small amounts of drugs. It didn't get them off the hook. It turned it from a criminal to a civil penalty with encouragement to treatment. Harm reduction methodology, supervised consumption spaces have been done in Canada. And that's where people with substance abuse, instead of shooting up to be candid about it in a, in a public bathroom at a McDonald's or under a bridge where they overdose and die. They go to a clean place. Two things happen. One, they, if they overdose, they get uh, immediate naloxone. There's always a rescuer there. And number two, they get connected to treatment. Portugal decriminalized all drugs and invested in public health uh, about 10, 15 years ago. People said, Portugal, you're going to be a haven for every heroin addict in Europe. And all these terrible things would befall them. Just the exact opposite happened. Everything in Portugal improved. Crime went down, discarded needles went down, disease went down, on and on and on. They improved their situation greatly. We need to learn from that. And so I put in bills uh, to try to shift this around, and some of them have, uh, are beginning to get some serious attention. 
Uh, I got beat up a fair amount politically for doing this, but now people are coming around that this is what is necessary to, uh, to change it. And my first bill back in 1998 was enacted and people look back now and say, how did you know in 1998 this was gonna be a problem? I'll tell you how I know, not because I was smart, I just talked to patients and I could see that the surge of drugs was becoming really serious and driving more and more healthcare and more and more healthcare costs. Key question, why are so many of us turning to drugs? What is going on? You know, you, you read about teenagers who seem to have good upbringings and adults who are in, in the prime of life suddenly getting into drugs. Why this level of despair? Now, this next paragraph is my personal opinion. I think it's our focus on material, what, material wealth, endless distractions in media, daily stress, and all the stuff that we have to endure, hurtful behavior spanning generations, and the influ emphasis of in individual over the community leave too many of us being isolated, angry, and unfulfilled. The opposite of addiction isn't just sobriety, it's connection. And so our focus on these things that are of shallow values, ultimately, and not satisfying, leaves us despairing. And so uh, ways to change our moods uh, be, occur more commonly. And instead of choosing healthier choices, as I described, we tend to go towards the less healthy choices. And there's that quote from uh, Kathy Park Hong. Now, just to balance that out with some science on this subject, you may have heard of this famous uh, study called the rat study, iconic rat study. And what it was, was a rat was put in a cage um, alone, uh, and there were two levers, one with drugs and one with food. And we were told that the rat would keep pushing the drug lever till it overdosed and died. Somebody repeated that study a number of times, and that was Dr. Alexander here. Uh, and this part of the story doesn't get told. He created Rat Park, a huge area for rats, everything that rats could like. Rats, other rats, rats games, cheese, toys, tunnels, whatever a rat would like, he created this rat park, rat utopia. And the uh, drug lever was there. Very few rats used the drugs. So it's not just sobriety, it's connection. I've stressed in my life, fortunately I have connections that keep me from wanting to turn to more desperate things. And uh, I don't, obviously, but uh, it's, it's the connection and meaning of life and doing things that are built around values that are real as opposed to shallow that help us. But what do we do with substance abusers? We put them in small cages by themselves for extended periods of time, years, and then we wonder why they don't get better. Whoever is going to get better in that situation? You're just getting exposed to more crime and more criminals. Here's some excellent references on this that will back up all the things I've said. Chasing the Scream, an outstanding book uh, on the whole history of the war on drugs. Michelle Alexander's book is a classic. It really is an excellent political and social analysis of how this really has targeted minority communities and how they suffer. A Knock at Midnight is um, uh, more personal stories of people's lives. It's really compelling. And we had our experiment with prohibition actual constitutional amendments, you know how hard they are to pass, to ban alcohol and then to uh, reintroduce it. Reintroducing alcohol didn't solve alcoholism, it didn't solve drunk driving, but it reduced a huge amount of crime, toxic deaths. We ought to learn from our own experience in this country. We can regulate drug use, we don't have to try to pro prohibit it, just makes it worse. And regulating in a sane and rational way, we can figure out how to do that, and that's a policy change that I think, I hope you will support and start to think about from a different perspective. Where we are is not random. These are the results of conscious decisions people made and we can undo them. And here's another drug vigil, overdose vigil. Um, last thing, there's my contact information. I'm welcome. Uh, any uh, comments from you, the criticisms, personal attacks, support, how I can help, whatever you like. I answer all my emails myself. I did write a book about end of life care endorsed by a number of famous people. And I hope to be talking about that with you um, later this year. One of the other topics that I do, and take a, please take a look at thebetterend.com. Uh, you'll find book information. I hope you uh, will take a look at that and buy the book and read it and think about it because that affects 100% of us because all of us are mortal. But this is the empowered view about how to manage that, the kinds of things that can happen and what you can do about them to manage them to your own personal value set, empowerment and circumstances, however you want it. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to joining you again on Knowledgeable Aging.
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Morheim. If you don't mind, could you spell out your uh, email address and the website of uh, The Better End for people that will be listening in our podcast? Sure. My name, Dan Morheim at gmail.com, D-A-N-M-O-R-H-A-I-M at gmail.com. And the book is Preparing for a Better End, Expert Lessons in Death and Dying for You and Your Loved Ones from Johns Hopkins Press, available through the usual sources. But the book website is www.thebetterend.com, www.t-h-e-b-e-t-t-e-r-e-n-d.com. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Morham, once again. And we are in the process of trying to finalize a November date um, for another webinar called The End of Life. Uh, stay tuned for that. As soon as we get some information, we will get that on the website and get it out to all of you that are subscribing to our newsletters, our YouTube page, etc. As far as Knowledgeable Aging, you can go to our website, knowledgeableaging.com. You can see all of our upcoming and archive webinars. We also encourage you to go to uh, YouTube, type in Knowledgeable Aging and subscribe. We update that, try to, four to five times per week. If podcasts are your thing, you can go to Spotify, Apple Tunes, etc. Till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging. Thank you.